What is up, everyone? Welcome to Dupe on the Volley, Philly Sports Network's union podcast. Uh, we're here for another pregame show. We got the union taking on Portland Timbers tonight at 1030. Uh, so we wanted to hop on and get a good preview of that match. But uh, before we get into that, we also have to talk about how the union got a draw last weekend down in Austin. Uh, we're going to kind of jump right into that. Uh, but first, I want to introduce our panel of uh people here today we have jimmy king how's it going jimmy hey not too bad it's uh it's been a long week of getting through stuff at work and uh waking up early so i haven't been as active on socials this week and uh with the coverage but as always it's it's great to be talking union soccer with you guys and uh we got a 10 p.m kickoff so it truly is mls after dark over here for uh all union fans, but i um, glad to start it off with uh, with a pregame show. Looks like the games are just about to kick off. So hopefully people are, are, are tuning in while uh, they get the first round of games on the TV as well. And uh, yeah, just excited to be talking MLS with y'all. Dude, I feel that it's it's uh, probably a brown liquor special for me tonight. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be a, <laughs> it's going to be a time. It's going to be a good time. Uh, we also have Paul here tonight. Paul, how's it going, buddy? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Same as Jimmy. It was a long week of work. Uh, finally good to have a day off. Um, I'm definitely going to need an energy drink to get through uh, tonight's match, but um, it'll be worth it to see some of these uh, young young talents that the union have coming through the ranks. And um, But, yeah, I'm just glad to talk union soccer with you guys and enjoy uh, MLS Saturday. Yeah, man. And uh, we know we don't have Eric here tonight. Uh, he's uh, having a birthday party, I believe he said, for his cousin. So I hope he's enjoying that here tonight on this weekend. Uh, we know he'll be back on the next episode. Hopefully uh, we'll be talking about maybe a, a union win or, you know, hopefully some points at least uh, from this match here. Uh, but before we get too ahead of ourselves and talking about Portland, uh, I know we wanted to talk about the union's draw against Austin FC, uh, the first ever matchup between the union and Austin uh in mls play um jimmy i know you had thoughts uh, about about the match so i'll kind of just throw it over to you if you want to give us a quick like rundown and synopsis of that game yeah absolutely well obviously coming you know going into austin it was coming off that absolute butt whooping uh down in mexico six nothing um if you haven't forgotten by now i hope you do soon but um, it, it looks like the team at least was able to move on relatively quickly. Um, got off the start with a quick uh, PK goal from Daniel Goslog in the 14th minute, which was probably exactly what this team needed, was a, an early goal to kind of forget everything that happened in the last game. Um, and it looked like things were kind of on the, on the right track. That was, um, I believe, the first lead that we had had in MLS, um, or at least the first time we had scored um, – in in the first half in MLS. Um, so it was great to get off to a, a quick start, um, but it was uh, quickly in the second half, all of that kind of went away when uh, in two minutes, Austin was able to score twice, uh, the first from Diego Rubio and the second from John Gallagher. And that really, uh, it, it was, just, man, just seeing uh, the first goal go in was, was hard enough, but seeing a second follow up, literal minutes if not seconds later um was was really really hard to watch um and it kind of felt like you know there was kind of some doomsday uh, mentality going on on twitter after that second goal from austin went in but um the story of the season so far um other than that pachuca game has been the resiliency of this union team and they were able to dig deep and get that equalizer from um, uh, michael ua in the 65th minute to secure a point on the road um so i, I you know i think uh, uh, some people are disappointed um having been in the lead in the first half. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things, when you're taking the loss from uh, the Tuesday prior to Pachuca, I think that this is a positive 
um, step in the right direction. And um, Jim Curtin also mentioned that he said he thought it looked a little bit more like his team. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a, a, a good step in the right direction. But I know some people are, are a little upset not to uh, not to get three points, um, especially with having the lead in the first half. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I was one of those people, honestly, on Saturday night. I was very annoyed with the, how the union showed that fight and they came out and got that lead. Like you said, it was the first lead that they had had in, in an MLS game this year. And then they let it go in two minutes. And I just remember kind of just being furious with the team of like, how how can you let this happen twice? So, you know, the first one was kind of you know, all right, like that, that kind of stuff happens, but then to go right on the kickoff again and get scored on uh, that, that really hurt. Um, Paul, how, how are your feelings uh, on that Saturday night? Um, well, so starting off with, I guess I'll start off with the early uh, God's dog go yeah. Um I was, um, if you weren't able to watch on Saturday night, I did predict for my Duke on the volley prediction that they would have their best first half of the season. Um, and to be honest, they, had a lead for the first time. So I would uh, mark that down as a, uh, as a good half, but going back to those two goals, like you said, Tim, um, in the chat, um, in our writer's chat, I right away posted what an embarrassment. I mean, yeah. it was, it was, I guess, terrible to say the least. Um, You had a lead, you had a good first half and you just, with a snap of a finger, you just let it slip away. And it was going back to the resiliency again. And it basically went from, oh, let's, we might actually get three points for the first time in the year to, I hope we can get a single point out of this game. Yeah. At least for me personally. I mean, it, it just really highlights, at least in my opinion, the defensive struggles that we've seen this team yes. have. And they've kind of been, we say that they're uncharacteristic, but it's almost characteristic at this point. And I think that's a, a major talking point kind of moving forward. And even as we get to talk soon about this Portland match, but I just want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, I, I think I, I wrote about it in the Portland preview, um, but I think the union have conceded, I'd have to double check the number, but I think it was 16 goals uh, in their first uh, seven games this season. Um, that's definitely not union like and not good enough. Um, but I mean, like, I just kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on the defensive performance. So I guess I'll throw it to Jimmy first. How, how, how do you think they're doing? Can they turn this around here? Uh, hopefully early on in the season. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating because even when the, the defense looks like it's putting in, you know, somewhat solid performances, we have those two minute lapses or those 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 one mistake that leads to a goal. And it seems like every time we are making a mistake, it's leading to a goal. And I don't know if if uh, that's, you know, if it should be chalked up to bad luck, like Jim Curtin is saying, and uh, uncharacteristic goals, or if, you know, like other people are saying, maybe this is starting to become um, a, a frequent a characteristic of this team. And if you look at Austin's um, attacking stats from that game, yeah. um, they have, they did have 13 shots on tar or, uh, at the net, but only two were on target. So they yeah. scored um, both shots they made or they took and they only amassed a 1.1, um, 1.19 expected goals. So um, they definitely over uh, perform their expected goals as well. Um, obviously scoring twice um, in the first half. I think they, they failed to reach like even like 0.2 of uh, expected goals. So, you know, union really did have things kind of under control defensively, or at least they weren't letting Austin have two high quality chances. Um, but again, you know, if you look at that first goal, it's just a, a ball that gets swung across the box and kind of misses both Damian Lowe and Jack Elliott. Um, and then the second one, I think you could kind of point at a number of people being out of position and, and not stepping to the ball quick enough. So um, I don't know, man, it's, it is frustrating. I don't, I don't know whether to put it on like a mentality thing. If they're, if they're just falling asleep, uh, if they're relying on this like resilience, resilience, see that they have and knowing that they can come back. Um, yeah. But once again, we still haven't seen a full 90 minutes from this team. And I, I think that's what's most disappointing for me. You know, we, we probably saw 88 good minutes. And if we had 90, we probably are walking away with three points in Austin the other night. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, that, that's a really good point, Jimmy. You bring up, you know, the resiliency and kind of leaning on that. And Paul, I want to get your thought on this. Like, yeah. I, I wonder if a lot of this could kind of stem from it, it's been the same back line, you know, with give or take a few players coming in and out, usually on the outside back on the right side um, mm -hmm. and maybe some center back. But do you think it's getting a little stale like they, that they might need new like new blood inserted into the back line? Yes. Um, I, I do think so. Um, if you run the same thing over and over and over again, I think teams are eventually going to figure out what these players are going to do, like what, where they're going to move at certain times in the game. I know you can't predict it a hundred percent, but when players start to do one thing, they could just continue to do it for their whole career. So if you continue to, um, throw out the same guys, even if it works one game, another team could, uh, figure it out. Um, some new blood might increase the competition, um, make make these players know, basically show that, yeah, you might be one of the top center backs. You may have been one of the best defenses in the league in the last couple of years, but your job isn't there. It's not safe. Um, yeah. Competition's coming. So I do think some new blood would be needed. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have to see how that kind of all shapes out here. I know the yeah. – for MLS, uh, teams can still sign some players, and we're, we're going to talk about how Portland signed a, a player just uh, this week uh, in a few minutes here. Um, but I do want to go back to um, the the stats just real quick for the Union over the season so far, uh, over their seven games. They've scored 11 goals, which is actually pretty decent for this Union attack, um, and they've given up 16 in those seven as well. So, you know, not, not the best uh, – start here for our Philadelphia Union. Um, but they are still undefeated in MLS play. Three games, three draws. So uh, look on the bright side. We can do that. Um, and and now we kind of get to get to the fun stuff of talking about how they're going to go to Portland uh without 10 players. Um so I don't know. How do we want to start this, guys? Do we want to just start talking about uh, Portland and, and kind of what they look like here. Jimmy, do you have any thoughts on uh, on this match coming up here? Yeah, why don't we just um let's start with uh let's start rolling out those graphics that we had ready. All right, Sweet. I think that, that'll be an easy way to kind of transition. Let's us to let's do it. So here here we go. I'll let you kind of talk about this one here, Jimmy. So here's the first one. We got season stats. Cool, right on. Um, so yeah, as you guys will be aware of, uh, the union started the season, uh, three draws to start the season so far, um, which has been a little disappointing. Um, the Timbers are off to a little bit of a better start, um, with two wins, one draw and one loss. Um, they, uh, have scored eight goals to unions five. Um, and both teams have given up five. And when you look at um, kind of their expected goals total and expected goals allowed total, um, Union is kind of uh, right on par for um, performing their expected goals as far as uh, output goes. Um, and is, uh, unfortunately, as we could probably maybe a little bit predict, um, is give, are they're giving up a few more goals than they probably should be right now. Um, on the other side of things, um, Portland's almost uh, kind of the opposite. Um, they are kind of scoring um, some goals that maybe they shouldn't be um, and from, you know, not as threatening positions. Um, but they are uh, also giving up um, quite a few goals as well. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the tale of the tape there. Both teams, as you can see from um, the average possession, neither team really um, prioritizes uh, keeping the ball and uh, keeping it away from the other team. Um, both teams enjoy getting on the counter attack. Um, so I think that uh, in, in combination with uh, a lot of new names coming into the lineup, um, I think it could make for um, some not back and forth soccer, I don't want to say, um, but for some goals being scored. I think that both of these teams have the ability to score goals and kind of let in goals that uh, um, might make their manager um, a little less um, happy with how things are going. So I could see some goals being scored in this one for sure. Um, and yeah, I, that's kind of how things line up between the two uh, uh, so far this season. Um, Tim, do you want to go to the next one real quick? Yeah, let's do it. There we go. As far as Portland, uh, Portland's top performers this year, 
Um, uh, Anthony does have three goals for them. And then they have a plethora of players that have uh, contributed one goal. We've got Moreno, Williamson, uh, Aspria, and Evander. And Evander, um, you know, he's obviously one of the guys that's going to be uh, one of the most um, targeted and uh, important guys to watch for the Union defense. Um, uh He's he's a great great player, makes a lot of plays, and as if you if you've seen uh, any of his games so far this season, he can score from um, you know he's probably the one that's contributing to Portland um, over exceeding their expected goals because that guy can score from outside the boxes. He's got a really lethal shot. Yeah, and it's also interesting uh, too, Jimmy, just to talk about their new head coach as well, Phil Neville, coming in and kind of reconstructing the team a little bit at least with Anthony I believe he was a new signing this year the rest of the guys uh have been with Portland for a little bit um but yeah it's just it's been interesting to see how he's come in and really instilled courage into his team uh that he's kind of talked about that in in some of the press conferences that I was able to see of, of Phil Neville talking about his team and how he wants to instill courage in them uh, especially moving forward with the ball, um, even in those quick counterattack moments, like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, they, they weren't an awful goal-scoring team last year, but they weren't um, blowing the doors off teams either. They were kind of right in the middle of the pack. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, having a little bit more of an edge offensively will, will uh, uh, play into – the way that Phil Neville likes to set up his team. And, and I think you can kind of see that coming. And, um, you know, we'll talk about it here in a little bit, but they've they've also made some moves in the transfer market to kind of supplement that as well. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of Portland's top scorers right there. If we want to um, move on talking about unions, um, not as much to talk about here. Um, well, I think, you know, the one good thing to see out of this is uh, Michael Ua, uh, two goals to start the season. Um mm-hmm. uh, someone that really, really needs to get off to a fast start. So two goals in three games in MLS is, is uh, what I would consider a pretty decent start so far. Um, Daniel Gazdog also has two goals so far this season. And then Ali Bedoya has the one goal for uh, Union so far. Um, uh, Tim, you were kind of saying this, but uh, I know we're only three games in here, but it looks weird seeing uh, this combination of names here. Um <laughs> I don't know. Did you, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Obviously Carranza um, was hurt for a couple games. So uh, it looks like he'll be back tonight. Um, do you guys have uh, hopes that the offense can kind of um, pick it up and, and maybe not get back to what we saw a few years ago, but at least uh, start to put a few more goals in. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there first. Like I, I was saying it, it does look kind of weird cause there's only three names on the list. Um, but also looking back at the way that the union play, it's kind of on brand that it's it's mainly their attackers getting the goals and then maybe Bedoya or a few other people from midfield um, kind of getting in there. Uh, I think that trend will likely continue. Um, and I'm hoping to see Carranza get on there as well. Um, we saw him score a lot in CONCACAF Champions Cup, but he hasn't really been able to, to play too much here in MLS. So, um, Paul, uh, how are you feeling yeah. about uh, this union scoring shorts here? Um, it's interesting, uh, to say the least seeing, you know, only like you guys have been saying, there's only three names on there, but then I think back to the union really have only played three matches so far. Um, so, and in my five goals in three matches, while they haven't won any games, I mean, that's not too bad. Um, depending on how you look at it for offensive output, but I do think Carranza coming back into the lineup tonight, um, that's going to be, or we're hope hopefully coming back in the lineup tonight. Um, that's going to be huge. He's their number. He's their top number nine, their top goal scorer. Um, so with Carranza coming back, I do think that number will uh, start to grow. Also with um, defenses looking to stop him and then maybe opening up for more uh, players to get the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another you know huge thing to point out for Union right now is um, this, you know, while some people, a lot of people, I should say, were not present for practice this week, this was the start of this team having um, full practices week in and yeah. week out. And that's going to be really, really, really important for this team. Um, so uh, that's, I think, you know, having more practices, not being in Champions League, that's going to be really, really important. So, um, yeah, just wanted to point that out on that um, front as well. 
Yeah, and we'll we'll move on and look at some availability report. Uh, we're going to start with Portland's. So I'll just kind of go through names here. So for Portland, uh, Claudio Bravo is out with an injury, uh, as well as Marvin Lorea and Trey Muse. I hope I'm saying that right. And then they we get to uh, the players that they'll be missing on international duty here. Miguel Araru, Arujo uh, will be with Peru. And then Maxime Cropo and Kamal Miller are both uh, both played with Canada today. Uh, they actually got a 2-0 win uh, to make it into the summer's Copa America in a playoff against Trinidad and Tobago. So uh, those uh, players there are for uh, the ones that will not be with Portland here tonight. So, um, Paul, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah. Um, looking at this list, uh, we know the union's list will be longer. Um, but mm -hmm. what kind of sticks out to you uh, on this uh, availability report for Portland? Um, I'm gonna go into one name, uh, Crepo. Uh, he's well, he's been one of the top, a bad, a decent, good goalie in the league for the last couple of years. He was on MLS. I mean, not, oh Jesus, on LAFC. Um, he had that bad leg injury um, against the Union in the final, but he's but he was a good goalie. And then he was, um, yeah. But um, I think that's huge because I haven't really looked into it, so I could be wrong here. But who? Portland will be playing in net. Um, do you guys know by any chance? I believe it's going to be former Montreal keeper uh, Jonathan Pantemis, I believe his name is. Okay. I, I think so as well. Um, I believe they, they went in out and got him um, this offseason just like yes. they did with Kripo. Um I know there were reports out there too that they actually had to recall a loan to have enough goalkeepers uh, for this game. So they're 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 feeling the, the strain just like the Union are uh, with uh, their availability. But yeah, it should be Pantamus, I believe. Is uh, yeah, I'm actually not sure if he used to play for Montreal, but that either he way. did. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure he did. That. The name sounds familiar. <laughs> Five years or so, yeah. Um, but another name that's big is Kamal Miller as well. Uh, yeah, he's a good defender for. Uh, Portland, I know he just came in the offseason from Miami, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. I could be wrong with that. Um, but, yeah, it's um, obviously it's not as long as the Union's list is going to be, but there are some big names on there um, for Portland, mostly starters on there. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also think, you know, we'll get to Unions here in just a minute and, and we'll kind of look at the depth chart and see uh, which areas have the most the – most, uh, have the most needs for tonight's game. Um, mm -hmm. But if you look at what part Portland's missing, they are missing some important pieces of their defense. Yeah. Um, yes. And while Union is missing Andre Blake, that is a big piece. They do pretty much have, you know, when Jim Curtin said this, they have the same back line that set the, the goals against record a few years ago. Yes. Um, you know, Olivier Ambizo was starting a majority of those games a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, with, with Jack Elliott and Jacob Lesnes and Kai Wagner in the back line, you know, that is one of the better back lines in MLS. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Union do have a slight advantage in having um, some key pieces in the defense. Um, but again, you know, we, we know that Portland does have some, some really threatening uh, pieces uh, offensively, and they're not missing as many uh, pieces in the midfield and the offense. So, it is going to be an interesting battle um, to see between kind of the depleted sides of the squad. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And Jimmy, you mentioned um, Portland having, you know, difference makers. Um, well, this guy right here is definitely going to be a difference maker for them. Jonathan Rodriguez, their new DP uh, signing uh, as an attacking player. Uh, they just signed him for $4.1 million from club America um, and he looks to be the real deal. And uh, the club put out uh, Portland that is put out uh, yesterday that he is available for this match tonight for Portland. Um, so Jimmy, I guess I'll just kind of throw it over to you first. Like, um, do you think we're going to, we're going to see this guy from the start from off the bench? And uh, the main question, do you think he's going to score a heartbreak uh, goal? Against us here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um. I think we will see him. I don't know if he's necessarily going to get the start, but the fact that he's going to be there in any regard is going to be a huge boost for, uh, for uh, Portland uh, and their players. They're going to be hyped up. They're going to be excited that the, the club has went out and, and gotten somebody and spent money to make the team better. Um, they're going to be excited. And 
it's going to be on Union to kind of settle down, not get too overly excited themselves, and just look at that as another player. Um, that being said, you know, I don't, I, I haven't watched uh, Rodriguez too much myself, mm-hmm. myself but um, the guy does have a, a really good uh, goal scoring record uh, in Liga in Liga MX. Um, was there from 2016 to 2024. Um, and had 108 goals and 27 assists in 277 appearances. Yeah. Um, so he can score goals. Um, he did score 21 goals and seven assists in 65 appearances for Club America specifically. Um, and so uh, he scores them against top comp- you know top competition, top teams in Liga MX. Um, and we just saw what. Uh, good strikers in Liga MX could do to this backline, so it definitely will be a challenge if this guy um, can get some some real playing time in. Um, maybe the one saving grace for Union is maybe he only gets a little cameo off the bench and and uh, doesn't get too much uh, time or uh, uh, um, space to kind of grow into the game. Yeah, um, we can, we can only hope with that one. Um, <laughs> Paul, I want to yes. get your thoughts on this because uh, you know Portland just brought this DP yes. player in. Uh, they spent four million dollars on him, record signing. Um, why can't the union do this? Is there a reason? Like, can you expand a little bit and maybe talk about that? Like, why is it that all these other teams seem to have the ambition to go out and sign a player of this caliber who mm-hmm. scored? goals in league mx or wherever else it might be like why is it that the union still are not looking for these types of players because rodriguez you know he's not a big european name he's only 30 uh mm-hmm. and I, I said a little too much on that but there you go uh what do, why do you think philly can't go out and do something like this um that's honestly i feel like it's not really the union's philosophy for um building a team, if you want me to be uh, straight honest, they like signing these young guys who will grow up and develop into, if they can get them into be a top talent and then they can sign for cheap money. Um, They love growing from their academy. Um, So basically my response is it really isn't the union's, um, Jim Sugarman's and the uh, union's philosophy to go out and spend money on a top talent and bring them in as much as everyone wants it. Yeah, I mean, it's just interesting, and and yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to let my my fan <laughs> hat too too far on here uh, as to why I'm I'm so frustrated about it. But I think um, looking at the union as a whole, uh, mm-hmm. not expecting them to go out and and sign any you know really big players right now, but just yeah. looking at this type of player for Portland, everyone has said for the past few seasons. Oh, Portland needs that true goal scorer. Yes. And they just went out and got someone who scored 108 goals over the last nine years. Like they went out and addressed the need. And if we look even back to 2022, when the union were just so close to winning MLS cup and they Mm -hmm. fell short, everyone was saying, well, what do they really need? They, they need that one attacker who has that killer instinct. Yes. Um, And it's it's someone that could maybe be like this type of player. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that's why I just get so frustrated when I when we see other teams in MLS go out and make these really smart moves and probably are going to get a very good return on investment. Now, mm-hmm. we've seen other teams go out and spend a lot of money on, on players who don't have a good return on investment. So I'm not saying that I just want the union to go out and spend money, um, but I want them to be smart and find this type of player. Um, Jimmy, do you, do you kind of have any thoughts on that? Like, do you think the union could eventually do something like this? I'm not saying they have to go out and spend $4 million on an attacking player, um, but, you know, can, can they get over that hump and find that type of person that might just bolster the squad a little bit? Man, I mean, I would I would hope so. I really, I think that's what everyone really wants and, and, and what this team needs to be honest. I don't think that union need to stray away from their, their philosophy and how they do things, but just adding one or two pieces every couple of years to, to, to make yourself better and, and, yeah. and bring your ceiling up. Um, it seems like such a, such an easy, um, such an easy decision to me, but at the same time, um, you know, every time, 
this team makes a final, every time this team qualifies for Champions Cup, every time this team, um, you know, makes a run in a competition, it just is uh, the front office's um, willingness to change because it shows them that everything that they've done and everything that they believe in is working. Um, and so uh, until they are ready to stop just being there and start winning, yeah, I don't know if, if things are going to drastically change. The one interesting thing I'll say about this, and, and, and the one thing that kind of rubs me the wrong way, and not rubs me the wrong way, but the one thing I, I get frustrated about, and it, I wish it would have worked out better, is, is we spent a decent amount of money on Tiberiba last year, and yeah. it seemed yeah. like it was more of a – um, a panic signing than a investment signing. It mm-hmm. seemed like we thought Julian Carranza was about to leave and we didn't know what to do. And so we needed someone um, to be there as soon as he leaves. And the dude hasn't sniffed the field really. Um, right. so it, it, you know, this team will spend money, maybe not as much money as other teams, but they will spend money. Um, but it's just getting to do it in the right way. And for some reason, I mean, I, I, not some reason, I know why, um, but the team just values low threat or um, they value, uh, you know, low threatening uh, deals, but high reward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's just the way they like to do things. And, uh, until they, like I said, until they're ready to um, take that next step and 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 be consistently winning trophies every year and not just being competing for those trophies every year, I, I don't know that we're going to see a drastic change. Yeah, it's just it's interesting. Uh, everything that you were saying there, I mean, it, it makes sense um, for the way the union do things, but it just reminded me of a few weeks back how Andre Blake had said that he didn't want to get in trouble about talking about the team's additions when he was asked a question, if they've done enough to um, kind of get over that hump of, and, and win something. And he, he kind of, I, I forget the quote a hundred percent, but I know he said, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble, but uh, we'll time will tell if, if we're able to do that. Yes. Um, and and so. then we got beat six, nothing. And down. yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. It's, it was almost comical how that all played out to be honest, but <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, speaking of comedy, we get to uh, look at the uh, union's availability list next here of oh all the players who are not available for this match tonight against Portland. Um, so we know the the players who've been out for injury. We know Leon Flock has, has been out injured, Isaiah LaFleur and, and Holden Trent. Um, but then we get to our international call-ups. Uh, Ty Baribo, who we just mentioned, is, is playing uh, for Israel. You know, uh, Andre Blake. And Damian Lowe are playing for Jamaica. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't beat the the USA in in the Concacaf Nations League semifinal, uh, but they'll be playing for third place on uh, Sunday night. Uh, Jesus Bueno and Jose Martinez are both playing for Venezuela right now. Uh, they played yesterday, I believe. Uh, they they played Italy. They almost won. They lost two one, I believe, was the score there. Daniel Gazdag is playing with Hungary. I, I know they played a, a match, but I, I didn't uh, get a chance to see what the score was of that one. Uh, and then uh, Nate Harriel and Jack McGlynn are both playing for the U.S. Uh, under-23s to get ready for the Olympics. And uh, they both started in a friendly against Guyana, I believe it was. Uh, and um, Nate Harriel got on the score sheet. So that was uh, some good, good stuff there from the union players uh, on international duty. But that uh, that's a list of uh, what almost well, eleven players there who are who are out tonight. And um, eleven, what's that? It's almost a full starting eleven. It is. It is almost a full starting <laughs> eleven. Uh, and then uh, not even on the list, but but players who probably could have been called up for this game from Union Two, who are uh, out with the U.S. U19s. Uh, David Vasquez and is it was it Neil Pierre? I don't want to get yes. This- up. Okay. I always get the Pierre brothers wrong. So I'm glad I did that time. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's just so many players out. Um, and, and Paul, I'll, I'll throw this yeah. to you. I know, I mean, we'll never get a straight answer uh, from MLS, but is, is the reason that MLS is still playing on FIFA international break windows? Uh, do you think it's mainly because of the fixture congestion that they've created for themselves? 
Um, yeah, I was actually talking to my friend the other day about this. Um, with that added extra month long leagues cup, if you take that leagues cup out, you have, I guess, you have an extra month to possibly work around that fixture congestion. And yeah. you know, like maybe add a game on a Wednesday and a Saturday, and then you don't have to play during the FIFA international breaks. Um, it's really something that I guess irritates me to say the least. Um, especially when you have top talents like the union, like players like the union, where you know 50 to 75 percent of your starting 11 will be gone. Um, yeah, but. I don't know. I'm just going to keep on rambling about how I hate how they play during international duty. Um, but I do think it has to do with that fixture conduction with the league's cup and all that nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's always so interesting because I mean, MLS has played in these windows even before league's cup was a thing. Yeah. Um, and, and Jimmy, I'll kind of throw this to you. I know um, Jim Curtin has even talked about it a little bit in his press conference before the match uh, for, for this match, saying, you know, like this is just a part of the league schedule. Like we knew it was coming uh, and we're going to prepare the best we can. Um, but how are you feeling about how uh, he can prepare his team when there's this many people out? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Um, it, it's it's difficult for, you know, I mean, the Curtin's always been a very, very open about the fact that uh, the, he's a very data-driven guy. The whole union um, uh, team is, and he's very open about the fact that if you switch or change uh, X amount of players in from a game to another game, most times you're not going to have a successful outcome. Um, so for a coach to look down and see that he's got 11, you know, 10, 11 players not available for – uh, a road game um, is, is gotta be difficult. And I think one of the, you know, even more frustrating parts of that is multiple of those players to not even feature uh, for their mm -hmm. yeah. team. And, and that's just kind of union's philosophy. They're not gonna, um, I shouldn't say they're not going to, but we haven't seen them um, say no to t to players being released the way that maybe like a Chicago has in the past. Um, and so that's you know it's it, yeah. at the end of the day it's it's on MLS for making them play through this and 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 uh, like Paul said having leagues cup in the way and and all of that and and so it's it it's difficult it's hard um, and like you said there's was even a few players that probably would have made their first team debuts and and kind of carried that torch that Union um, so strongly believe in and, and bringing up their youth players, those guys are not available either because they are also called up. So <laughs> it's just been a, a really difficult time. Um, I, 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 I commend the union for even going out and, and having um, a team to play um, on Saturday night. Um, but that being said, uh, we'll see this in a second. They do have a good core group of players that I think uh, should, should allow them to have a strong performance either way. Yeah, and, and real quick, before we jump into that, I do want to bring up this comment that kind of came in right as we were starting. Um, and I want to kind of get your guys' take on this. Uh, it says, if you're listening uh, and, and not watching, it says, if Curtin and Tanner knew that the team uh, wouldn't have depth this season, why did they get rid of Torres and Perea, uh, the players that they brought in at, on the offseason of last year? So, uh, yeah. Paul, I'll throw this question to uh, you first. Yeah. Uh, why do you think uh, that is? So um, I'm going to start off with Pereira. Um, as you see with uh, the Tiberibo situation, if a player really falls out of order with Jim Curtin, um, so they do something to him, they really won't see the field ever. So um, I feel like that's what happened with Andreas Pereira. Um, and pers I personally thought he looked good in his few appearances for the union last year, so I didn't agree with the decision. But um, Curtin, I guess – Curtin didn't like uh, what he saw from him, and he kind of banned him from the 11, uh, from uh, even the 18 some games. Yeah. Um, so they sent him off to New York. but And then um, Torres, uh, I don't – that loan signing really came out of nowhere, um, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I thought in preseason this year he was having a pretty good preseason, to be honest. And then I remember during one of our episodes it was just – a report came out of nowhere uh, that he's yeah. like, he's gone. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, I guess, I don't know. It's, it's a tough question to be honest, because 
I guess the players didn't really fit in with what Curtin wanted. Um, so why would he have them on his team if he thought he had younger youth players to uh, re- possibly replace them in the future? Yeah, it's just it's just so interesting though. Then, then why is. were they even signed in the first place? Like that's oh yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, uh, wrong and in, wrong investments. Yeah, uh-huh. and like you saw even in the the few minutes that those two players played last year, like that they could play and they were very good. Yes. Um, so Jimmy, like I'll, I'll kind of throw this over to you again. Like, like you think that there's kind of like a not a rift between Tanner and Curtin, but that like the communication isn't really going well. Uh, I don't know how to kind of phrase that, but that's, that's sort of what it seems like from last it, off season through this off season to now into the beginning parts of, of this season here. It does to me a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to say that he's kind of hinted at that. I don't necessarily think that he's hinted at that in his press conferences, but I think he yeah. had, things like um you know you can all you know we have to rely on punching above our weight and Mm -hmm. and like that that kind of insinuate like hey it it would be nice to have a little bit of of help here and and whether that's him just asking for new players or or better players or him asking for specific players i'm not sure and I, i don't have an answer to that but it does seem like there's there's some sort of disconnect between the players that Ernst Tanner wants to bring in and however they're identified and the way that Jim Curtin wants to integrate players into his, um, into his team. Um, It's, it has, it has to be an issue at this point. I mean, you look at the last couple players that have um, been transferred in they're they're no longer here and we didn't bring anyone in in their replacement which i think is even the biggest the bigger question mark to me than uh why were they brought in is why did we let them go and why did we not bring in anyone in I, mm-hmm. I guess we still have time so i'm I'm trying to remain hopeful on that um but yeah why, why have we not brought in anyone in why did we not plan for this game right yeah and i mean we're now a full month into the season um you know we've seen the union this will be their eighth game already in a month and they knew this game was coming and the the window is still open for them to sign some players and and they haven't done it yet so i mean we'll see um let's get back to uh to talking about the uh the players that will be playing today um and and we want to bring up another graphic here this one kind of just shows uh, the players who are on the roster, and if you can see the players that have the little uh, X's over them, are the players who are on international duty. Um, so, Jimmy, I'll let you start with this one. Um, if you you know you're starting to look at at the depth chart, um, and and you see a lot of the players who are in the uh, the starting positions are are out, or maybe uh, the ones who who are kind of relied upon as a uh, maybe subs or, or things like that. But uh, how are you feeling about this many starting caliber players being out for the union? Yeah, I mean it, it's not only that, Tim. You know, not only the guys that normally start that that are missing, but it's a lot of guys that um, <laughs> you you look at the spaces that need to be filled, and you say, okay, well, move this guy over here and. And then this guy can move there, but then yeah. the guy that you would replace that guy with is also on international duty, or that guy's injured, or um, so it's it's hard to uh, you know looking at when you look at this depth chart, you look at it and you um, you know there you know the the forwards look to be intact, um, the defense look to be intact, but that midfield is is really kind of a toss up. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was really going to be difficult. Um, And I think, you know, that is, that is where um, the two teams, you know, like we talked about, Portland looks a little weaker um, due to their uh, international duties in the defensive part of of their team. Um, Union surely are looking a little bit more depleted in the midfield. Yeah. Um, Paul, what are your thoughts on, on how this roster is looking right now? Um, To be honest, I'm really looking at this midfield and um, I'm trying to figure out, what is Curtin possibly going to do? Because yeah. like Jimmy said, you like you move one guy to this place. You're like, oh, that guy could play there, and this guy could play there. It's like, but then who's going to play there? Um, mm-hmm. Thankfully, our forwards and defense is intact, like Jimmy said as well. So I guess that's a good thing. And then you've also seen Semle, Semle play a little bit this year. Yeah. So at least you got some 
comfort in there playing him in front of this defense. So the main problem, like we knew it was going to be coming in, is that midfield. Um, and I really, honestly, I'm trying to think. So you got Raffanello, obviously, at Cam. Um, mm-hmm. I'm assuming you're going to move Bedoya and Sullivan are going to be your two, like, uh, your two on the right and left side of the diamond, I would assume. Um, yeah. But then I'm really trying to feel who are you going to play in that um, that CDM role? Yeah. And it's I, tough. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. If Tim, you want to pull up the next graphic here and, and, yeah. and I want to start before, you know, as we pull this up, I don't necessarily know that this will be the formation or the players that play in this yeah. formation. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jim Curtin did give a few hints on yeah. uh, Friday, yesterday afternoon in okay. this conference. Um, he did say things like, uh, "It'll you know tomorrow will be a big opportunity for guys like Jeremy Raffanello, and he'll be alongside guys like Ali Bedoya and Quinn Sullivan." Um, so, just hearing things like that, you know, there's three mm-hmm. names right there off the bat. We've seen Bedoya go on that left side, so I have him slotted yeah. there. Um, I've got Quinn on the right because that's kind of where he's been playing. Um, at the same time, I could see them going with kind of a uh, uh, dual 10 situation as we yeah. you know, saw with Raffanello and, and Gazdog. Um, mm-hmm. Like Paul pointed out, the, the biggest question mark really is going to be that, that defensive midfielder position. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. We've, we've seen Elliot play there a couple times in the past. I really hope we don't see that um, here tonight. Um, I just don't, I don't prefer him there. Um, but I did the only, the really only other thing that I can think of besides maybe Matt Rial is uh, Sanders Nagabo. And he did play in a defensive midfielder position for Union 2 um, yes. last weekend. And I thought he looked pretty good. I don't know that he necessarily looked good enough to go and start against uh, Evander and Jonathan Rodriguez. I don't know if he's ready for that. Um, but he might be thrown into it and – and, uh, and, you know, he might have to pull his bootstraps up and, and just dig in and, and try to muck it up and, and cause havoc and, and not try to make any special plays, but just try to disrupt the midfield and, um, you know, kind of take over that, that uh, Brujo mentality of just really getting under people's skin. And he does kind of look like he has that kind of um, that kind of mentality and that kind of, um, uh, you know, feng shui on the pitch so uh I, i'm interested i i i think that's the biggest question mark for me is who's going to play there yeah i i think and as so you guys were kind of talking about that and and when i was looking at this um the one thing that i think about nagobo um being in that spot and i i don't think they'll want him to be on an island mm-hmm. but i think he has to play i i think they're going to play him uh, so I, I do think sort of what Jimmy was saying, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the lineup, uh, the formation at least uh, gets switched up a little bit and maybe yeah. you put uh, Bedoya next to him as kind of two holding midfielders. And then you have Sullivan and Raffanello as kind of the roaming tens, sort of like a four, two, two, two. I mean, they already, you can already play uh, a pressing style. Um, you know, it's, it's more of a selective press now than just an all out press. But I think if they were in that kind of formation, it might actually work to their benefit of kind of clogging the middle of the field, uh, forcing things wide. Um, but I mean, it's, it's really kind of a toss up. Like you guys are saying the one, the one other thing that I have, I've considered Jim Curtin doing is, is maybe starting someone like, uh, Marcus Anderson for Mikhail Uba. Um, just really somebody that's just going to chase down um, some inexperienced mm-hmm. defenders, make them make plays on the ball, make them make passes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, Uwa does a really great job of, of stretching the defense. So, um, you know, you kind of lose a little bit there. Um, but without with with a little bit less creativity coming from the midfield, I wonder if he kind of splits uh, the forwards mm-hmm. and, and doesn't rely on – um, both of them kind of going 90 minutes and kind of splits that up a little bit. Um, that's, that's, that was the only other thing I was really um, kind of working out, but I, I do think we'll, we'll probably end up seeing both Uwa and Carranza um, just go with those guys that are proven goal scorers for us. I, I really like that thought though, Jimmy, and it, it takes me yeah. back to uh, Union circa 2018 when they were doing the 4-2-3-1. 
Um, and I think that would actually work really well with the way that the defense is set up. You would have Nagovo and Bedoya next to each other. You'd have Raffanello at the 10, and then you'd have two wingers. You'd have Sullivan and Anderson play on the wings with yeah. a central striker of yeah. Carranza. I, I actually think that might be the move. Um, but but like you said, it's, it's unlikely that a uh, curtain kind of switches it up that much. Uh, I also really like the idea of Ua coming off the bench and kind of saving uh, some of the uh, stronger attacking players for later on in the match, um, as we can all kind of assume that the union are going to be playing for a draw, at least early on. Um, and, you know, if they get scored on or if it is a draw uh, later on in the match, and if you want to throw Ua on with that pace against a tired defense with where it's missing some starters, that uh, that could pay some dividends. So, I mean, we'll see um, how that goes there. Um Paul, do you have any kind of thoughts on what we might see for lineup or, or the players playing today? Um, I really do like that. I have four, two, three, one idea. Um, it's always one of my, it's honestly one of my favorite formations in all of uh, the sport. And I kind of, I think it would work perfectly, but um, like you both said, I don't think Jim Curtin moves away from his philosophy. I do think he's going to end up going with the diamond and um I guess I'll make a bold prediction that um, the lineup we're seeing on the screen is um, I think that's what we're going to end up seeing tonight. All right. All right. I like it. I like it. Well, um, we're, we're kind of towards the end of our preview here. Um, I know we want to get some more kind of final thoughts and, and, and Paul, you kind of just did an on the volley take there. So uh, maybe let me, let me throw it over to Jimmy. Do you have any other kind of on the volley predictions that you want to make for this match before we uh, get out of here? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily too, um, too out of the ordinary or, or, or too, um, crazy of a, a prediction here, considering the amount of goals union are giving up, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth game, which we know Jim Curtin always says union don't like to get in those type of games, but yeah. I don't know. I just have a feeling for whatever reason that, um, both teams are going to score goals tonight. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to – I think from Portland's side, I think we're going to see the names that we kind of expect to pop up. Yeah. Um, but I think from Union's perspective, um, it, it is really going to be about um, – I think it's going to be another game of, of playing catch-up for Union. Um, if, if a goal scored, how do they respond? How do they dig back? Um but I don't know. I'd love to see a, a, an early PK goal. My one question to you guys is: is who takes the PK without without Gostock? Ooh, Ooh. Be Carranza. Um, I, I think it's Carranza. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Actually, you know what? I'm going to throw throw a, a curveball in there. I actually Ooh. think it might be Jack Elliott um, because <laughs> he has stepped up to take some big penalties for the Union before uh, in playoff matches. Um, and he, he always kind of like fancies himself in, in that kind of role, especially like I, even when he lines up for free kicks, sometimes he's like, I want to take a free kick. Mm -hmm. And then Wagner or McGlitt will kind of look at him and be like, no, please go into the box. You big center back and get your head <laughs> on the ball. Um, but I, I think, uh, that, that might be something to keep an eye on too. If the union do get a penalty, maybe we'll see big Jack Elliott run up there and try to take the ball. Um, <laughs> Um, but so, sorry, I know that wasn't wasn't necessarily a, a, a prediction, but my on the ball yeah. take is that it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth game. I think tonight, a little uh, a true uh, MLS dark uh, MLS after dark action tonight. I, I think that's what's coming Union's way. You just stole mine. I was going to say I, I think this is going to be a true MLS after after dark game where you come into it thinking one thing and then something crazy happens. Um, whether that be a goal fest or whether it be, um, you know, just so teams struggling to really put it together. I mean, that's sort of what happened last week for Portland. They were all away uh, at Houston. They, they lost one, nothing, um, but they put a lot of plays together, but they couldn't put any goals in. in. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the union's defense uh, thinks it's uh, 2022 and, and they run it back and it's all good, but we'll see what happens with that um so uh, let's see now i gotta make a different on the volley take uh you know what Here, here's one and it's not something too crazy because we've seen this player play a little bit already this year but i'll say that my on the volley take is that 
Ali Semla makes one outstanding save that you don't expect him to make. Um, he really showed oh well um, in, in the few games that we saw him play. Um, he's looking like the kind of backup that the Union need for Andre Blake. So that'll be my my take there. Yeah, I agree with that, Tim. I, I, I think th- that actually kind of brings me to another point I wanted to bring up, and I couldn't yeah anywhere but um a a couple people on twitter and in the mls like official mls pundit space have kind of brought this up i I think it's a really great point um the last time one of the last times union kind of had this many people missing in their roster was that um covid game against nycfc and yeah into that everyone said you know there's they're gonna get the wheels beaten off of them by nycfc Mm -hmm. um and they really held their own and I wonder if Jim Curtin's kind of digging deep in his pocket, in his back pocket, or um, one of those old time speeches where he's just getting the players, you know, fucking hyped up. You know, yeah. um, it's not even about playing your best soccer right now. It's about getting the guys, the the warriors that you do have available for battle, um, mm-hmm. all ready to go. And and I think I'm hoping that's what we see is a really energetic team um, come out and. A few of those guys, like Semla, like um, maybe uh, Sanders and Gabo, maybe um, Jeremy Raffanello, really just taking their opportunity and, and and trying to make a difference. And you know, we didn't see Raffanello do much in his in his first appearance against SKC, but um, like I said, I think there may be a little bit more. Um, uh, it, internal motivation to kind of perform while the rest of your team is, is away um, on international duty. I think union like being with, I think union like having their backs against the wall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that just kind of reminded me, uh, this is a really random thing, but I remember when um, I was preparing for the union versus Seattle game that got rained out. Um, I was looking back at past union games uh, and, and remembered a game where the union went on the road to Seattle and they were huge underdogs back in 2018. Um, they, they had more of their starting 11 than they're going to have tonight against Portland, but they went into that game knowing that they were underdogs And then I believe at one point, Jack Elliott actually got a red card and it was still zero zero. And everyone was like, Oh, here comes the Seattle goals. And they never came. And then a union legend, in my opinion, Fafa Pico scored a 90 plus something minute winner and ever, and it was union union after dark. Everyone went crazy at, you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, Union snuck a one zero win. Um, So, uh, you know, if Curtin can find that speech and the players can really take that to heart, maybe mm-hmm. we'll see something like that happen here tonight. Paul, what do you, what do you think? Um, honestly, I feel like the boys um, last week, we saw them go out there and play more passionately um, come with that comeback. I think the boat you'll see, I'm not expecting them to win for say, but um, I do, I'll pick a little bit of a surprise. I do think you'll see the boys come out and then I think you'll, They'll fight out to a draw tonight. Uh, I'm going to go 2-2. Two, two. Carranzo get his first of the year uh, for the for the MLS play. And then the other goal, I uh, I would love to see a Rafa first uh, ever goal. Yes. I love that. Jimmy, do you have uh, a score prediction for tonight? Uh, I, I was also going to say 2-2. Two, two. I think I might have put that in my MLS uh, preview. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I did want to point out, obviously, Providence Park is a really hard place to yes. play. Um, and I remember – I don't remember the exact situation, but I I remember us going to Portland a few years ago and not a lot of people not feeling super great about it, and they ended up winning 2-0. Uh, yeah. Daniel Gostov had that, like, half bicycle kick in the fifth minute, yeah. and then uh, Sergio Santos uh, also scored early in the second half to, to uh, seal it. Um, so Union do have a history of, of going to Portland and, 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 mm-hmm. and you know, showing up. So um, I'm hoping they can dig deep and, and at least get a, a draw here. I'm going for a 2-2 as well. All right. I, I'm feeling it. I, I want to be with you guys. Uh, but I'll be honest, in my preview article, I said that I was not feeling good about this game. And I actually predicted a, a 3-1 loss uh, just because of the attacking pieces that Portland had. I, yeah. I will love it 
when I am wrong. Like, I, I really, really hope that I'm wrong. Um, but it just seems like a game where Portland's coming off a tough loss where they feel like they should have got a point or won the game down in Houston. They're coming back home. They got a new DP. Uh, to me, that sounds like they're probably going to score three goals, um, and I don't think the Union can score three. Uh, but again, I'm I'm happy to be wrong, and I hope that I am wrong in uh, in this game here tonight. Um, so I guess, uh, hey guys, do you have any other final thoughts that you want to say before we sign off here? No, no, just uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, the pre pregame shows have been really great, and. Yeah. I think we're just going to keep rocking them while people are interested in them, um, especially with kind of the late game kickoffs. It gives uh, people some time to, to do something before the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, thanks for all the support this year. Um, super happy to be doing this. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to know um, uh, if there's any MLS fantasy players out there, I'm a big MLS fantasy player and I've been looking for more people that, um, in the union space that play. So if that applies to anyone, um, please reach out to me. I'm going to try writing, um, a fantasy article every week, okay. uh, some players that I think are, um, uh, good picks and whatnot from each position. Um, if you have any questions on that kind of stuff, let me know. Um, and, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, just following along this year. Yeah, and we got uh, Jose Nunez popping up in the chat here saying uh, hi to Paul and uh, and also bye Paul. So there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, say hi and bye in the in the same minute there. Um, well, guys, that'll do it for this episode of Dupe on the Volley. Like Jimmy said, thank you so much uh, for tuning in uh, and really just you know. Uh, having a fun uh, chat along with us here. Uh, feel free to, to keep doing that as we keep doing these pregame shows for away matches. Uh, when the Union are home, we're probably going to stick to our normal Thursday night podcast night. So if you want and you can, come on in and join us live for the live stream then. And if you can't catch that, you can always watch it back or listen to us uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, all the stuff. Uh, follow us on our socials on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but until next time, I'm Tim, that's Jimmy over there, and that's Paul, and uh, have a good night, and hopefully we're talking about a union win the next time we all come to together. Have a good one, guys.